Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A gang of truck hijackers has been working in your city. They've stolen 14 loaded trucks. They've kidnapped and beaten one of the drivers. There's no clue to their identity. Your job? Get them. With the winter season coming on, young America and all of us will be concentrating on our favorite winter sports. Ice skating, bowling, basketball, skiing. One thing you'll notice, whatever young America does, wherever it goes, Chesterfield goes along. Yes, Chesterfield is the choice of young America. Chesterfield is the choice of more thousands of smokers everywhere. People are learning the facts about Chesterfield, learning that Chesterfield is highest in quality, low in nicotine, learning that Chesterfield is really mild, really satisfying. How about it, friends? Change to Chesterfield yourself. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular and king-size Chesterfield. Best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, June 4th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss of Chief of Detective Stad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 9.47 a.m. when we got to the county hospital. Ward 419. Hi. Mr. Gilmore? Yeah. I know you guys? No, sir. We're police officers. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I do, sir. Hello. Uh, a couple of stools over there. Drag them up. Sit down. I'll get them. Here you go. Thanks. How do you feel, Mr. Gilmore? <laughs> rough. <laughs> Real rough feel like I've ridden 50 miles in the back of a ready-mixed cement truck. Weren't for the pills they'd be giving me, I'd think I'd go off my rocker. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us what happened? Yeah, as much as I can remember. Only goes so far, then there's a room full of black. If you'll tell us what you can, please. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, that's when it was. Yes, sir. Yesterday morning. I checked in for work. Had a load I was going to take over to Phoenix. Supposed to shop off about 10, 10, 15. Did you know what you were carrying? Yeah. I saw the way, Bill. Some of the stuff they were loading. It. Used furniture. Didn't make any difference to me. They load the truck and I'll drive it. Uh-huh. I went across the street. Little coffee place over there. Got my back and bottle filled and came back. By that time, they had the truck loaded. I signed the way, Bill, in the office and went out and got into the truck. The two guys were waiting for me. They were in the cab of the truck, huh? Yeah. Sitting there, kind of scrunched down so you couldn't even see them from the outside. Yes, sir. As soon as I opened the door, one of them had a gun pointed at me. Told me to get into the truck like there was nothing wrong. Just start the motor and get the truck away from me. Did they get out of the truck at that time? No. No, they were waiting for me when I got there. They, they told me to drive away, and I did. Wasn't going to mess around with them having a gun. Yeah, go ahead. Then we drove about three blocks, and they told me to pull into an alley just off of Santa Fe. Santa Fe and what? Do you remember? Uh, by Porter Street, between Porter and Enterprise. I see. Like to go ahead? Then they told me to pull into the alley, and... And when I did, they made me get out of the truck, took me around back and broke the seal and told me to get inside. And that's what you did? Officer, if they'd have told me to jump off the city hall at a gun, I hadn't done it with that gun pointed at me. Yeah, I'm a coward. Fellow weighs a gun around and nothing's going to do just like he tells me. Yes, sir. Those guys are mean, you could tell. How's that? Oh, I'm a kind of a student of phrenology. I could tell about those fellows real plain. Student of what? Phrenology. You know, bumps on the head. Huh. They all mean something. Of course, I didn't get a chance to make a good examination of these guys, but I could see it. Real criminal heads. Bumps told me so. One fellow had a head that was one of the worst I'd ever seen. Yes, sir. It was mean to his mother, I could tell. Had a bump uh, right here. Here, you see? Huh. Yeah. It was mean to his mother. Yes, sir. 
Well, what happened after they tied you up? Just left me there. I see. You want to go on? Yeah. They must have drove for about 20 minutes when they stopped, pulled in some sort of a driveway. I figure that. Well, right after they stopped, they made a half U turn and then backed up. Backed up this ramp. Steep. Then they stopped and took me out of the truck, blindfolded me, and made me get out of the truck. Now, this place where they stopped, that's where they unloaded the furniture, did they? Yeah. Uh, they must have taken it out of there. I heard them thumping around in the truck. Sounded like they were unloading it. Well, now, what'd they do after they got all the furniture out? Put me back in, drove out to where you found the truck. After the, they both climbed into the back, beat me up. Don't remember much after that. Mm-hmm. Both of them worked you over, huh? Yeah. yeah. Both of them got in their licks, especially the one who was mean to his mother. He was vicious. He was mean. They kept hitting me with their fists until I just passed out. Don't remember anything after that until I came to in the back of the truck. That's when I called the cops and the guys in uniform came out. I guess they're the ones who called you. Yes, sir. Now, is there any way that you might be able to tell us where they took you? You mean when they unloaded the furniture? Yes, sir. Well, I think maybe I got an idea. I tried to figure out how fast they was driving. And after you've been a driver for a while, you get to know. I'd say they were going about 20 miles an hour. We were still in town. My own guess is that they went out of Alameda. Must have gone out Santa Fe and then turned on to Alameda. Mm-hmm. I remember hearing kids yelling, that'd probably be Santa Fe High School. Yeah. I guess we went out Alameda to maybe 43rd or 44th, and they turned right. Kind of hard to figure it then. The truck got tied up in traffic, and it was hard to tell if they were stopping for that or they're just at a light. You know? uh-huh. But I'd say that they went out to about Avalon. You know? Maybe they went up to San Pedro? I don't think so. I'd say Avalon. Then they turned left and headed for Hawthorne. Not sure how far they went. But I'd figure maybe around Rosecrans, and then they turned a couple more times, and they stopped and drove up that steep ramp. Mm-hmm. Now you figure they ended up around Rosecrans and Avalon. Right? Yeah, yeah. I guess that's not much help, though, huh? Well, it gives us an idea where to start looking. Well, a couple other things that might help you. What's that? Well, it seems that when we started to back up the ramp, I heard a bump, like they backed into a car. They didn't hit it hard, but I bet they did hit a car. Yeah. After that, they pulled the truck forward and stopped and backed up again. This time, they scraped into the side of a house. I could feel it run along the side of the truck. It sounded like they might have torn up some of the wood on the house. Yeah. Will that help any? Yeah, sir. We'll have our crime lab check the truck and see if they can come up with anything. Sure hope you can. Oh, um, you talked to my boss yet? No, sir, but he's been notified, we understand. I bet he's plenty sore about it. Well, we wouldn't know about that, but he should understand that it wasn't your fault. He should, but he won't. I know. Is that right? Yeah. He doesn't understand anything that doesn't go on his way. Spotted a mile off. What's that, sir? His head. All kinds of bumps. Ten oh six a.m. We continued to question the victim, Russell Gilmore. He gave us descriptions of the two men who kidnapped him. He also told us that at one time he heard one of the men call the other by the name Leo. Further, he told us that when the two bandits had taken him from the truck, they placed him in a garage. He was able to feel the wall, and he said that he was sure it was a plaster wall, and as much as he could feel the studs and the wire holding the plaster. He said that at one time he heard a woman come out of a house and say something to the thieves while they unloaded the truck. He told us that the garage wasn't very large because there was no echo on the sounds that were made in the building. We called the office and got out a supplementary broadcast on the thieves carrying their description. 10.40 a.m. Frank and I left the county hospital and drove over to Central Station. We went up to the crime lab and talked to Ray Pinker. On the right rear fender, we found evidence that the truck had hit a car. Lifted some paint chips. Got them here. Uh-huh. Looks like a blue car, huh? Yeah. I checked the paint with a ditch of production color book. Here, I'll show you. Got all the paints cataloged by color. Uh Uh-huh. Here. This is the one. Yeah, but, Ray, there are a lot of blues here. How can you be sure this is it? Well, here. You see, they got a color patch on each page in the book, a hole in the patch. Oh, this little hole here, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, we just put this chip we lifted from the truck in the hole. Now lay it down. Get this lamp. There. Color matches. Get them the same light, and you can see they're the same paint. Huh. Look at that, Joe. Same. Yeah, I see. Well, what do we got out of it, Ray? The car the truck hit was a 1953 Hudson Jet. It was a single-tone car. You know, the top color matches the body color? Yeah. They only use this on one-color cars unless you got a special order. Mm-hmm. Did you find any house paint on the side of the truck, Ray? Yeah. Over here. 
Might be able to do a little better on that for you. Uh -huh. House the truck ran into is about 36 years old. Might be a little more than that, but it's right around there. How could you come up with that? It's been painted 18 times. Figure once every two years, you come out with 36. Yeah, but how do we know it's been painted every two years? We don't, Frank, just guessing. But the layers of paint are pretty even. Might indicate they did it regularly. You know, didn't let the paint go too far before they redid it. Oh, yeah. Here are the chips of the house paint. Here, I'll put one of them under the microscope. Here, take a look, Joe. Okay. You see okay? I haven't got a... I'll adjust it. Yeah. I see what you mean. Well, you notice the first coat was a cream white. Mm hmm And they stuck pretty much to that for the next half dozen paint jobs. Then they changed to a barn red. Then to a green, then back to cream white. That goes on for three layers, and then to the blue that's on it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, Ray, if we find the house, can you tell us if it's the same one? It shouldn't be too hard. Aren't many of them around. Well, how many? Well, 18 coats would be 18 factorial. That's multiplying 18 times 17, times 16, times 15, so on to times 1. I got it worked out for you. I hope you have. I'm Here. not with you at all. Here. Well, look. Works out to 1 in 6 quadrillion, 402 trillion, 373 billion, 705 million, 728,000 chances of finding its twin. Oh, uh, that's pretty long odds. Well, if every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth owned 10 houses apiece, there wouldn't be another one like it. Eleven thirty-seven a.m., we put in a call to Leighton Prince. Harlan Stahl told us that his crew had gone over the truck thoroughly, but had failed to come up with anything. We contacted the stats office and asked them to make a run on the M.O. that the thieves had used. They told us that the results would be ready for us late in the afternoon. We contacted hit-and-run detail, but there'd been no reports that could have been the car that the truck had hit. We went to the office and got a large map of the city, and then we drove out to the county hospital to talk to the victim again. We asked him to trace his movements while he'd been held prisoner in the back of the truck. He drew a line down Santa Fe Avenue, up to Alameda, then over to Avalon Boulevard on 43rd Street. From there, he traced the streets down to Rosecrans Avenue. He drew a circle on the map centered on the intersection of Rosecrans Avenue and Avalon Boulevard. He told us that we'd find the house we were looking for inside the circle. Before we left him, we made arrangements for the mug shots to be taken to the hospital for him to check for a possible identification of the suspect. 12.40 p.m. We contacted Records and Identification Division and asked them if they'd had any luck on running the name Leo. We were told that they had three possibles for us. The addresses on the packages were not in the area that had been circled by the victim, Russell Gilmore. We got in touch with Lieutenant Jack Smyers and filled him in on the developments. He called Metro Division and made arrangements for three additional teams of men to work with us in a search of the streets within the circle drawn by the victim. He also contacted the divisional commanders and asked for their cooperation. The men were instructed to find a residence with a steep driveway leading to a detached garage. The house would have a wooden porch on the right side of the house as it faced the street. It would be damaged to the wood on the porch. Also, there was a possibility that a Hudson automobile would be parked either in the driveway or on the street right next to it. The car would have some damage done to it. 5.15 p.m. Frank and I got back to the office from the search area. Man, I'm sure tired. Oh, I'm with you. A lot of streets out there. Yeah, a lot of houses on the streets. I wonder how the guys from Metro are doing. I don't know. I'll get it. Robbery Friday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, just a minute. Let me get there. Yeah. Okay. Hang on to it. We'll be right out. Right. Well, the Metro boys did some good. Huh? The house. They found it. The address given us on the phone was 1486 Cedar Street down in Compton. It took us 35 minutes to get out there from the city hall. The officers from Metro Division Reserve stood by until we got there. We found the house located on Cedar between Dwight Street and Tawada Avenue. It was a one-story frame building with a stucco garage in the rear of the lot. On the left front side of the house was a wooden porch which had been scraped by some large object. Several of the pickets in the railing were broken. On the street in front of the house next door, we found a 1953 Hudson jet painted a light blue. There was a dent in the left rear fender. We couldn't tell for certain, but the color of the car and the color of the paint on the porch seemed to match the chips that we'd seen in the crime lab. While the officers from Metro covered the rear of the building, Frank and I rang the front doorbell. There was no answer. We checked the garage, but we found nothing that would tie the house owners in with the robbery kidnapping. The interior walls of the garage were rough wooden studs. Between them, we could see chicken wire embedded in plaster. 
The physical description of the house, the ramp leading to the garage, the garage itself, and the car parked on the street matched in every detail the picture that we'd been given by the victim. 6.10 p.m. We got the name Conrad Lewis from the mailbox in front of the house, and while the officers from Metro checked it with our office, Frank and I went next door to talk with the neighbors. Yeah? I wonder if we could talk to you, ma'am. Sure. Who are you? Well, it might be better if we got in off the porch. You huh? ain't coming in here unless I know who and what you are. We're police officers. Oh? Yes, ma'am. Here's our identification. Oh, yeah. Well, come on in. Thank you, ma'am. I'm Myrtle Richards. This is my partner, Sergeant Friday. I'm Frank Smith. Oh, how do you do? How are you, ma'am? You just sit down. I'll turn off the television. Thank you. Comedy. I've seen it before a couple of times. I always laugh at them again, though. They're funny. Yes, ma'am. The great bone of the people, television. This one's only 12-inch, but I think maybe next year I'll get a bigger one, maybe even color. They got it now, you know. It's true color. It's beautiful. Yes, ma'am. Of course, I ain't actually seen it myself. I just read about it, you know. Beautiful. Oh, I'm a great fan. I got it on all day. Right from the early show to the late, late show. I understand next week one of them stations is going to start an early, early show. Now, that'll be nice, won't it? Yes, ma'am, sure. I wonder if we could ask you a few questions. My, certainly. You just go right ahead. That car out front, does that belong to you? The blue one? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's mine. I just got it a few months ago. That's what you're here about, huh? I beg your pardon? About how somebody hit my car. Big dent. Isn't that what you're here for? No, not exactly. Do you know who hit your car? No. I wish I did. If I knew, I'd sue him. Imagine hitting a car that's parked right at the curb, not leaving a note or something to say who did it. The person who ran into me must be insured. Wouldn't cost him nothing. All he had to do was leave a card. Yes, ma'am. When was the automobile hit? You Yesterday know? morning. I walked down to the market to do some shopping and get some things for dinner, pretzels, potato chips, things to eat while I watched the TV. When I got back, the dent was there. Did it while I was gone. Did it and didn't even leave a card. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us who lives next door to you, please? Which side? The left side over there. Well, that's Lewis's house. Why are you asking about them? How long have they lived there, do you know? Yeah, I guess it's been about ten years. They moved in right after Conrad. That's Mr. Lewis, right after he opened up the new store. What line of business is he in? Well, he got some kind of a shipping business. Has deals with different stores all over the state. Did you see Mr. Lewis yesterday? Yes. Matter of fact, I did. He come over like usual at 5.30. He usually come over at that time, does he? Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, yeah. You see, there's a TV show he likes to see. I watch it, but his wife don't care for it. She watches something else, so Conrad comes over here. He was here last night. You see him during the day at all? No, I didn't. You know where they are tonight? I'm not sure, but I think they went to the movies. Seems to me Mrs. Lewis said that her and Conrad was going to a show over in town. That's probably for us. I'll get it. I imagine so. Didn't anybody come calling on me this time of night? Oh, it's Henderson, Joe. I'll be right back. All right. Have you noticed any trucks in the neighborhood lately, Mrs. Richards? Oh, well, I'll have to think about that for a minute. Mm-hmm. You don't mean like the garbage you can truck, do you? No, ma'am. Large moving vans. I see the others quite a bit. Yeah. Well, now, let me see. Well, there were some people who just moved into a new house down the street. That was about a month ago. That didn't help? Well, thank you, Mrs. Richards. Joe, see you a minute. Yeah. Excuse me, please, Mrs. Richards. Yeah, you go right ahead. Anderson ran the name Conrad Lewis through the files. Mm -hmm. He's been convicted for armed robbery. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Smokers by the thousands are now changing to Chesterfield because they're learning the facts about Chesterfield. Facts like these... A doctor has been examining Chesterfield smokers for 20 months, almost two full years now. We've just received his latest report, and it confirms again no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's a matter of record, and so is this. Chesterfield is the only cigarette proved highest in quality, low in nicotine. Those are the facts about Chesterfield. More good reasons why Chesterfields taste so good. Smoke so much milder. How about it, friends? Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Chesterfield. Regular and king size. Best for you. <laughs> The 
record showed that Conrad Lewis had been arrested for suspicion of armed robbery 10 years before. He'd been brought to trial, convicted, and sent to San Quentin. He'd served six years, and then he'd been released. He was not on parole at the time. Frank and I parked our car down the street from Lewis's house, and we waited for him to return. At 10.57 p.m., we saw a dark-colored Lincoln sedan turn onto the street and swing into the driveway of the Lewis residence. A man and a woman got out of the car and entered the house. Frank and I waited a few minutes, and then we walked up to the front door and rang the bell. Yeah? You Conrad Lewis? Yeah, that's right. Who are you? Police officers like to talk to you. Sure, come on in. What's this all about? Something wrong? You own a truck? Hmm? A truck. Do you own one? No. You mind telling me what this is all about? Can you account for your time since Monday night? Why? Can you? Look, I don't know what this is all about, and I'm not going to tell you a thing until you let me know what you want. Now, what do you want? The answers to those two questions. <laughs> Twelve fifteen a.m. It had been only a little over 48 hours since Russell Gilmore had been kidnapped and beaten, and we had a suspect in custody. However, Lewis refused to admit any complicity in the crime. We talked to him for several hours, but he told us nothing. He admitted that he'd been arrested before and that he'd served time in San Quentin. However, he stuck to his statement that since his release, he'd done his best to live by the law. With the evidence at hand, he was booked at the main jail on a charge of suspicion of violation of Section 211 P.C., we obtained the keys to his place of business, and Frank and I went out to check it. It was a large wholesale store selling used furniture. A search of the premises failed to turn up any of the stolen merchandise. While Frank went through the stock rooms, I checked the business ledgers. Nothing back there either, Joe. How'd you do? Well, according to these, Lewis does a big shipping business. That's what the woman next door told us. Yeah. Uh, been making shipments up to Oakland regular. Books tell what they were? Yeah, right here. He's been sending large lots of used stuff to a place on MacArthur Boulevard. There's a whole list of it here. Tables, living room sets, TV sets. Better get in touch with the police up there and have them check this place out, huh? Yeah. Without that stolen property, we're not going to have a very good case against him. You got the address of the place up north? Yeah. Let's go back to the office and get a call in. Right. Sure hope they come up with the answers. Well, if they don't, we might be in trouble. Yeah? The DA's office is liable to throw the whole thing out. Thursday, June 5th, 8.20 a.m. We put in a call to Captain of Inspectors Tony Bolger in Oakland and asked him to check on the recipient of the furniture shipment from Lewis. We also gave him as detailed a description of the stolen merchandise as we were able to obtain. In the meantime, Lewis had been admitted to bail and was released. Thursday, 11.15 p.m., Frank and I got back to the office from checking a lead on one of the suspects who'd driven the truck. I got it. Robbery Friday. Yeah. Yes, it is. All right. Tony Bolger from Oakland. Let's hope we called it. Yeah. Yeah, Tony. Yeah? Well, what'd he say? Well, that's the way it looked from here. What? Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. How about it? When you talk to the man who bought this stuff, he's clean. How about the merchandise itself? It's all stolen. Eleven twenty p.m. We got in touch with Lieutenant Smyers and filled him in on the new developments. After we talked to him, we contacted officers Max Herman and Ed Benson and made arrangements to meet them at the house on Cedar Street. It took us less than half an hour to get out to Compton. The other officers were there by the time we arrived. While they covered the back door, Frank and I went up to the front. I think he knows it's us. I don't know. Try it again. Well, the car's in the driveway. We know he's in there. Wait a minute. Sounds like somebody's coming now. Yeah? What are you doing out here? Aren't you guys ever going to get over my back? Mind if we bank? come in and talk? I got a choice? No, you haven't. Well, then come on in. You want to go through the house again? That won't be necessary. Yeah. Well, I'm glad of that. What's it about this time? Same as before. Maybe you better spell it for me. We huh? can go that route if that's the way you want it. Go ahead. I like fairy tales. All right. We got a report from a victim who was robbed and kidnapped. He was able to give us a description of this house, of your garage, and of the whole setup. You've been on a spike again. You're seeing things. We took a sample of the paint from your front porch. It matches paint found on a truck that was hijacked. A lot of houses in L.A. Not painted like this one. You think you're going to send me to the joint with a batch of paint? It's going to help. Look, cop, you know I've been the rounds. I've seen enough trouble to know it's rough to get a conviction with circumstantial evidence. That's all you got with me. Nothing more. Now, why don't you go home and I'll just forget you were here tonight. We got the plant. What? We got the plant. They moved in on it. The man you sold the stolen furniture to is willing to test for You know, we got you cold. Now, why not cop out? That's the way it hangs, huh? That's the way. All right, I'll get my coat and go Just with point you. it out. We'll get it for you. In the closet. Never mind. He isn't making a point of it. Outside. He's in his car. Yeah, come on. Yeah. 
He's heading down toward Rosecrans. Better hit the siren. Right. He's turning on the Rosecrans. Take a left. I got him. See him? Wait a minute. Yeah, up ahead there. Try a shot? Better not. Too many people around. Can't you close in on him? I think we're pulling up. Making a turn. Yeah. Stay with him. Hang on. It's a dead end, Frank. Yeah. He's in trouble, Joe. Come on. Yeah. Well, let's get him out of there. Yeah. Hey, that door's stuck. Wait a minute, I'll give you a hand. There. Can you get him? Better call an ambulance. The motor's in his lap. Is he still alive? It looks like it. Can you help me here? Yeah, let me get in there. All right. Come on. Let's put him down here. Yeah. All right, take it easy, Lewis. I'll call the ambulance. Right. Take it easy, Lewis. We've sent for a doctor. I didn't see the sign. I didn't know the street didn't go through. Lousy break. Lousy break. I'd have made it if I stayed off this street. You'd never have got me if I'd stayed off this street. I just turned the car, and all of a sudden, I was on a dead end. Afraid you're wrong there, mister. Huh? You've been there a long time. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 14th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Well, here it is, the most talked about Christmas gift of the year, the Chesterfield Christmas Carton, now featured in nearly a million 300,000 retail tobacco stores from coast to coast. The famous covered bridge has been honored this week by a new Christmas tune, the Kissing Bridge. You'll be hearing a lot of it between now and Christmas. So give the gift that everybody's talking about, America's most popular two-way cigarette, regular and king-size Chesterfield. Premium quality Chesterfield. Best to give, best to get for Christmas. Conrad Austin Lewis and his Confederates were apprehended and brought to trial on 11 counts of grand theft auto and one count of kidnapping. They were found guilty and sentenced as prescribed by law. Grand theft auto is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one, nor more than ten years. Kidnapping is punishable by imprisonment for a term of from one to twenty-five years in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Perrin, Virginia Gregg, Jim Griffith. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely new Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. By new Fatima, the smooth smoke with Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering and Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. This Christmas, give Fatima in the special Christmas carton. Cork tip and plain ends too. Hear Merle Muller and the news next on the NBC Radio Network. You've been listening to the OTR Gold Network. Find more classic radio at otrgold.com.